Okay, welcome back to uh, session two of Why I Believe. I did preach this in front of the church, but the audio didn't work. So it looks like this morning it's just me and it's you. So, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll go through, from pick up from where we, uh, where we left off. And so we covered off on the nature side of things, uh, historicity, uh, Bible accuracy, and the other thing that challenged me was Bible prophecy. Okay, so Isaiah 46, 9 says this. It says, remember the former things of old. I am God and there is none else. I am God and there's none like me. He makes a specific point of difference in this part. It says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God says this, he says, in, he says in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, come let us reason together. Now when I started looking at these prophecies, I was familiar with Nostradamus, I was, uh, we were from a family that was uh, into the occult, so we were tarot readings and, and tea leaf readings and things of palm reading, all this sort of stuff, astrology, and I tell you what happens, you pop along to a, to a clairvoyant of some description and they say, oh yes, I, I see a man in, in your, your future uh, in, a, in the month of September or something along these lines. It's very vague and, uh, and sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong. Uh, but God says this, if I'm God, then I declare the end from the beginning and it will stand. He says, if I get this thing wrong, you'll know I'm not God. But it, I am God. And so as we go through these prophecies, you'll see, you'll notice. I want you to notice how specific the prophecies are. They are just spot on to the minutest of details. And we're covering off very, very few of these prophecies. There are thousands, hundreds uh, in a, of prophecies in, in the Bible. And you're thinking... How could they possibly all be right? What's the, what's the margin of deviation if you do probability analysis? And it's zero. Now, there's some that haven't been fulfilled. We don't know. But on the ones that we can see but behind us, we say, my goodness, it's 100% accurate. So I struggled when I began to look into this area. So we'll click to the stride. Before we start in it, one thing you need to know is the, uh, about the Septuagint. Now, Septuagint uh, is... It, is the earliest Greek translation. What had happened is basically Rome had taken over the Greek Empire, but the language that they used, that everybody used among the, the Roman Empire, the language they could all understand was Greek. Okay, so uh, the Jews also, that was what they spoke in. So every day in the markets they were speaking Greek. And so uh, what we have was uh, they need to understand what the scripture said. So they said, uh, let's translate the, the, uh, the Hebrew scriptures into a, a Greek equivalent. So they established a thing called the Septuagint. Uh, now, that was written in 270, around two, 270 BC. And so uh, we know uh, that, that all of the things that are written in the Old Testament were codified there. And so we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that it was in existence. Because of the preciseness of some of these prophecies, some liberal theologians say this. They say, well, it was, must have been... There's no way that they, the prophets could have known uh, exactly what was going to happen. And so these must have been written after the fact. But we know from the Septuagint they were written before these events occurred. In fact, there's over 600 prophecies dealing with Jesus Christ, uh, which uh, were all fulfilled. Uh, and, and we think... Uh, we're not even going to be addressing those today. We're just going to pick some of the really obvious ones. And so um, the Septuagint, 270 years before Christ. And so we're going to slide on to the next one there. Okay, so does prophecy confirm the Bible? We're asking that. Or, or really what we're asking is, does God know the end from the beginning? And so uh, here's one for you. Here's one that I struggled with when I looked at it because we just take it for granted in where we are now. But Psalm 22:16 says this, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierce my hands and my feet. Galatians 3.13 says this, referring backwards, says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. 
Now that's re re referring from a scripture in Deuteronomy. So in the Old Testament we have Psalm 22, they pierced my hands and my feet, and cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Now, when you read the Old Testament, the thing that puzzled me was the way if you were a murderer in the Old Testament, what was the way that they uh, killed people for a capital crime? It was stoning, but it doesn't say cursed is everyone that's stoned. And all the marijuana smokers out there said, thank God for that. But it says cursed is not everyone that's stoned. It says cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Now, the thing that you've got is Jesus Christ being crucified where they split the dates between history. <laughs> you think of the historicity of Christ. Our whole date in Western society hangs on it, doesn't it? The fact that we're in 2017 right now, we even measure that by the time that Jesus Christ was there. So you're thinking of the historicity of Christ. Well, why did they change the dates if they didn't believe? And so we go on like that. But having said that, the cursed on it, he's crucified. It's... it's, it's written it's that's what it is it's crucified people died testifying that this is what happened well the problem is that when this was written that when this was written it wasn't even um, crucifixion wasn't even established at that stage it was 600 years but written before 600 years before crucifixion was even invented it was invented by the persians and the romans adopted it but if you read psalm 22 there's no no way you can read that without having in your mind a crucifixion the question is how did they know what a death like that looked like when they'd never seen a death like that before because everyone that they'd killed was either killed by an arrow a spear um, possibly hanging uh, you know, stoning to death. They were all the punishments that they had. And yet we have it prophesied here that he would die and be cursed on our behalf with his hands and his feet pierced. There's many other things that can prophesy in that regard. But let's move on to the next one for the sake of time. And so we're saying, does prophecy come from the Bible? Well, here's a scripture, another scripture that challenges us and even challenges us some today. It's Isaiah 11, 11. It says, it shall come to pass that in that day, the Lord shall set his hand again the second time, second time. Okay, let's come back to that. To recover the remnant of his people. Next verse. And shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah. From where? Is it from Assyria? Is it from uh, Babylon? No, it's for the four corners of the earth. Now, when Isaiah wrote this, it's in the midst of the Babylonian captivity. They're taken captive. Some of them are taken away. Uh, we know Daniel, Meshach, Abednego. All the, you know, there's a select group that is taken away. And m much of the population is taken away into captivity. Isaiah writes this. It'll happen He's writing in that day and he says this is going to happen, particularly to Judah, a second time. It's all going to go. And, but what's going to happen is he's going to regather them a second time from the four corners of the earth. Not from the north, not from the south, not from the east, from the west, but from all of those spheres. Now I want to ask you, and anyone rationally looking back in history, you say this. Has there ever been a nation that once was then was totally obliterated and absorbed and then re-established. Has there ever been a nation where the language has become extinct, defunct, and yet it comes back together and that becomes the national language? Has it ever been a time of that? And yet Isaiah prophesied this nation will be gathered again. I want to tell you that it's, you can see on the slide, in the 14th of May, 1948, that state of Israel is born. It says, can a nation be born in a day? And yet that's exactly what happened. And I had to look at history and say, wow, how did he know that was going to happen again? Because I'm sure... When the nation of Israel was dispersed into the diaspora, when there was none, when there was no such thing, they thought that was the end. And yet Isaiah prophesies that that's not the end, that there's more to come. 2,800 years before it happened, he pens those words. How did he know? Was he a, was he a, a visionary? He was simply writing what the God of the Bible says. I will write the end from the beginning. 
and he does that 2,800 years before it ever happened. Let's move on to the next one. Does prophecy confirm the Bible? Well, here's one for you. In the last book before the New Testament, Malachi 1.11, it says this, From the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Now, I want you to think of this. Who is the most hated people on the earth? If we were going to pick a group today, and we say in all of history, I mean, the, the Germans certainly would have been in the middle, in, in, in the Second World War, maybe First World War, who knows. Maybe China would have been at some stage, maybe Japan at other times. But consistently throughout history, who is the most hated group of people on the planet? It's the Jews, isn't it? They've had Russian pogroms. They were expelled from Britain. Uh, they turned their backs on them. America turned their back on some at, at, at various times. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, obviously the Holocaust and things along those lines. All throughout history, which fulfills prophecy as well in Deuteronomy 28. But we go, go through all that and you say, how is it that this name, uh, that Malachi writes this thing and says, hey, his name's going to be great among the Gentiles. Now, they were brought, uh, Israel was brought in to testify to the nations. Had they evangelized any nation? Nada. Zero. And so, uh, no one at the point of the time, there was not another a nation there that you could say, okay, they were Jewish and yeah, they were following the Torah and all that sort of stuff. Uh, they got themselves circumcised and, 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 you know, kept the covenants, all this. There was no other thing like that. There were sporadic amounts here and there. Uh, but there was only one nation that committed themselves at least in, uh, in name to that. But he says, the name of our God, this Jewish God, will be great among the Gentiles. Now, what's going on in the West today? What do we say? We say, we can't stand you Jews. Get out, get out, get out. The anti-Semitism is on the right. It's irrational. It's satanic in my view. It's the only thing that can drive. It's a country that's one third the size of Tasmania. And yet the Jews, which also fulfills prophecy, have undue influence throughout the globe. No doubt about that. When you look at the, the amount of Nobel pr uh, Prizes and, and that they get, there's one third of them going to these sort of people. So it's inordinate for this, this group of people. But they're hated. But by the same token, while we hate the Jew, we say... We love the, the Hebrew book. Give us your book. We love the Hebrew God. We can't stand you Jews. Now, how insane is that? I had to grapple with the fact that these guys, that Malachi prophesied 400 years uh, before, it was, before Jesus was even born, and obviously 2,400 years before the nation was born, that this, this name of Jehovah, of God, Yahweh, this Jewish Hebrew God, that his name would be great all around the globe. Now you've got to ask yourself, does that name ring around the world? And if it is, it's great among the Gentiles. And how would you prophesy that? How would you prophesy it? Here's another one, and this is probably more relevant for our day. Uh, Zechariah 14, uh, 12 says this, and this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh, listen to this, their flesh shall rot away while they stand upon their feet and their eyes shall rot away in their sockets and their tongue rot away in their mouths. Now I want you to think here and you'll look at the slide there, you can see a picture of a man from Nagasaki where his face, when the bomb went off, the atomic bomb went off, the, his face literally melted. And obviously there's a lot worse than that and some better, I guess. But picture the time that it was written. Okay, picture the time that it was written. What, that was 2,500 years ago. What were the weapons of warfare at that time? Maybe you had a, a sling. Maybe you had a, um, a bow and arrow or something like that. Maybe a spear. And uh, it, that's, that's great. But uh, boiling oil, maybe. But do any of those weapons fulfill what Zechariah is writing? None of them. Not one would fulfill the fact that their eyes rot away in their sockets, their tongue away in their mouths. While they stand on their feet, their flesh will rot. What sort of weapon are we talking about? 
a nuclear weapon. This thing has only come into existence uh, when I guess Einstein got involved and, and America did the unthinkable dropping those bombs on Japan uh, to end the war. Uh, but those weapons had never ever been seen or heard of before. You got someone 2,500 years ago simply writing what God told him to write. He puts it on a scroll, writes those words down, and we are left in our generation to interpret that. Does God know the end from the beginning? Does he? I grappled with this stuff. God, are you real? And when the more I got into it, I needed more faith not to believe in God than I needed to believe in God. And I found myself struggling. Struggling. Here's another one that can only be fulfilled, I guess, in our day. It says this in Revelation, the book of Revelation 13, 17. Everyone knows about the name of the beast. If, even if you're not a Christian, uh, everyone knows about the mark of the beast. And it says this in Revelation 13, 17. It says and that no man might buy or sell except he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now try to imagine imposing that in the ancient world. In the ancient world, they did have agoras and things along those lines. If you look at our tapes on the, on the seven churches, you'll find that they did put marks and, and subscriptions over the agora and things along those, such that Christians uh, couldn't trade in those areas. But how do you stop people buying or selling in an agrarian economy? Because I grow the potatoes, I grow the tomatoes, I grow the corn, I grow the grain, whatever it is, and I just simply barter with my neighbour who has pigs or chickens and whatever, and we effectively buy or sell in a barter way. But this guy's predicting that there's a time where you cannot buy or sell except that you have the mark or the name or the number of his name. And in our day and age, what we are seeing is the implantation of technology. I did speak uh, a couple of weeks ago about uh, MYB releasing an article saying that they're preparing in the next five to ten years for that type of economy, that they're writing software right now to, um, to facilitate those sort of transactions where we'll all be chipped. Because we need to know, after all, if there's a breach of security, who it is, so we can track that. And what if the federal police came and said to those doing these Manchester bombings and things along those lines that are going on terrorist acts, they said, we can stop that. Do you know how we can stop that? We can stop that by uh, putting a chip in there and we can track everybody. We know how much fertiliser is getting bought. We can track those projects cause, pro products because they're all chipped as well. Uh, and we can, we can see what people are buying. We can see who's gathering together so we know who the f affiliates are. And I tell you what, people who have suffered a terrorist attack, a major terrorist attack, they'll say, give it to me. We're sick and tired of being the victims. Give it to us. That's what they'll say. And so, um, so uh, we, what we've got here is, uh, is Peter sitting on a rock uh, and writing stuff that could only be fulfilled in our day. The question we're asking is, does God know the end from the beginning. We must answer that question. We must answer that question. Okay, and so when was that written? 2,000 years ago, of course. Here's another one in Matthew 24, 14. This is the words of Jesus. And he says this, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Now, there's two prophecies in there. Let's just deal with the first one. Think of this. Uh, there's a guy that comes out and he comes from Moranbar, just say. Okay, we're living in Queensland. Uh, Moranbar's a tiny little town as, as Bethlehem was. So he's born in a place like that and he comes one day to your house and he's a carpenter, he's a chippy. He's in there fixing up some of your architraves or something on those lines. And he says these words to you. He says, now, you may not believe this, but my words, I'm actually uh, writing a few things um, and uh, we have a, like a little club outside in Moranbar and, and what's going to happen is my words that I'm telling you today are actually going to travel throughout the whole of the world. And you'd be sitting there saying, uh, uh-huh, hmm, just invoice me for this job and then if you could please go, that'd be great because you're obviously insane is what we would think. The question you've got to ask yourself is, has the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
the teachings of Jesus Christ? Has it travelled, starting in Jerusalem, from there throughout the whole of the world? Is there a place that you could go to on the planet? And I'm realising, you're looking at the map now, that not every country is a Christian country. But what I want to ask you is, has the gospel been there? Like China, places like that. There's been Hudson Taylor, many Christian missionaries going there. And Christianity is exploding in that country right now. What about Africa, that continent, all gone? What about South America? Yeah, all over it. What about Russia, places like that, communist countries where they've driven out God? Yeah, but was the gospel, has the gospel been preached? And even now, if you went there, if you said the name Jesus Christ, you know, would they know who it was? What about all the Islamic countries? Well... Uh, sorry to say that uh, Islam is a recent newcomer to religions and, uh, and so what was there before that? Uh, the gospel were in all these places. The seven churches of Revelation are in Turkey. Yes, they're all uh, uh, taken over now. But the gospel is there. And should I say to you, if you go to one of those countries, let's pick a, a nice, uh, moderate, uh, fundamentalist uh, Islamic country like Saudi Arabia. If you go there and you mention the word Jesus Christ you'll get persecuted. If you open a church, you'll get killed. So uh, the gospel has gone, whether they've accepted or rejected it, that gospel was those words that Jesus spoke on the hillside in, uh, in Judea. Did, he, did they come true or not? When he said that this gospel that I'm teaching, not the gospel that he's teaching or they're teaching or over here, none of that, the gospel that I'm speaking of this kingdom will go and be preached in all the world for a witness unto every nation. Ask yourself, is that true or is that not true? And if it's true, you've got a problem. Just as I had a problem, because I had to, ex I had to try and reconcile what I believed to what this book was telling me. And I was failing. And when was that written? Of course, it's written 2,000 years ago. So how did he know that was going to happen? Maybe he was very lucky. If he's that lucky, I want the Powerball numbers off him because I could do with the money. Okay. Does prophecy confirm the Bible? Let's quickly step through this other one. Now, most people will know these things, but I'll just run through it again. In Daniel 9.25, it says this, Know you therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah... The prince or the king shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Let's translate that as old English. Let's get that. Seven plus three score, three times 20 and two. So you've got seven plus 60 plus two, 69 weeks. The street shall be built again, the wall even in troublesome times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Karat is the word killed, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come uh, and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, what we've got here is a lock-in date. From unto, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah will be 69 weeks. We've got a prophecy here that locks in a time period. It's one of the few that I know of in the Bible that actually locks in the time. But the, Daniel's writing down what's being sh shown to him, so he just simply writes down the words. Has it come to pass? What we're effectively saying is, for, you see on the slide, commandment to rebuild Jerusalem, to Messiah, to the Messiah. We've got 69 weeks of years. So if I said to you, I'm here, going to be here again in a decade, you know exactly what I'm talking about. To the Jew, we have... Uh, a week, a normal week, as in the creation week, so six days and seven of the rest. Then we've got also a week of um, weeks, uh, okay, they've got feasts and festivals that use that, that, and then also we've got weeks of years, because you've got, uh, you know, the Jubilee year on the 50th year, so you've got 49, seven, seven weeks there. So they, they understood this thing, that it can mean multiple things, and so we're assuming that it means years. Okay, so 69 weeks of years, so 69 times 7, we're saying from the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem, the prophecy is from that day to the Messiah coming will be 483 years. 
consider the accuracy of this prophecy. And I should say that I'm indebted here to someone who uh, let me know of Sir Robert Anderson's book called The Coming Prince. At that time, I believe you can get it today, I've still got my original copy that I downloaded, someone who was good enough to scan all the pages in, and I printed it off from the internet and I read through that, and I thought, wow, this guy was a, a detective in Scotland Yard and uh, did all this uh, in his spare time, discovered all this stuff. What you'll discover is that the commandment to be build re Jerusalem, and there's four possible dates, four of them that's possible, but the only one, we're not talking about rebuilding the temple because it talks about uh, rebuilding the wall and, and uh, the streets and all this sort of stuff. So it's not just the rebuilding of the temple, it's the city. And so when we look at that, we've got Artaxerxes Longimanus actually decreed this thing. It's a historical fact, 14th of March, 445 BC. You can read it in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 5 to 8, and 17 and 18. That becomes our start date, which locks, in, locks God in, doesn't it? Because if we've got a start date, all we've got to do is go 483 years past that date. So we've got, this, we've got the start on here. The Bible, the next thing you want to look at is the Bible uses 360 day years for prophecy purposes. Weird, weird, weird. But there's no doubt the, the key for me would be Genesis. In the book of Genesis, uh, you read in chapter 7 and, and chapter 8, uh, the flood narrative, and it's evident that God uses a 360 day year. It's also in Daniel 9, 27, 12, 6, Revelation 11, 2, 3, 13, and uh, verse 5. Uh, so it's multiple places confirms that this is the, the practice he uses. The interesting thing to note is that all ancient cal calendars that we can track actually use a 360 day year up until the same point when it completely changes. So the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Hittites all used uh, a 360 day calendar. So it wasn't strange for the time uh, in which it was written, I guess. Um, and like I say, they all change at the same point, which there is a theory behind that, but we don't have time to go into it today. So 360 day years is what we say. And then, there, so we calculate that out, 69 times 7 times 360 day, uh, that gives us 173 days, that's uh, so 173,880 days. So now we know the exact date. If we can calculate from the start date, which is 14th of March 445 BC, and calculate 173,880 days, when we need to know when, when the Messiah came as a king, because that was the scripture, wasn't it? That it would be until the Messiah, the king or the prince. Uh, and we think in Zechariah 9.9, 9, um, because Jesus many times was going to get uh, presented and tried to be as the king, is that right? And he said, no, 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 my time is not yet. Okay, many times that happened. But there's one time when Jesus actually says, go and get this and organize that and, you know, and we'll get this organized and it'll be good. You know, we're, we're going to organize this event. When is that? In Zechariah 9, 9, we, we get the, the, the gist of it. It says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes, riding on, a, comes under you. He is just and is having salvation, lowly and riding upon a donkey. And, a, and upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, anyone who's familiar with scriptures, when is that? It's the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Palm Sunday, they cut off the palms, lay those down. They sing the psalm that announces the Messiah. Remember, Pharisees understood what was going on. They said, hey, they said to Jesus, you should stop these people. This is blasphemy. They, they knew what was going on. They're declaring him the king. And so we know the day when that happened. That day in history... Uh, was uh, the 6th of April, thir 32 AD. That's the end day. And you see the calculations there. So we go to 445 BC to 32 AD. It's 173,740 days. Then we go March 14 to April 6 to calculate the difference in days. It's 24 days. There's leap years in there. So we've got to calculate 116 days. Do you know what it all adds up to? 173,880 days. Can you believe that in the book of Daniel... The very day that Jesus would present himself as king unto the people of Israel was prophesied. And you know from scripture that that's the fact because he stood on the hill at Jerusalem and said, how many times would I have gathered you? But you would not. And you should have known the day, this day. Why should they have known it? Because Daniel prophesied that very day, start to finish. And that was done 600 years. 600 years before Jesus was born. That put the nail in the coffin for me. I thought, my goodness, 
either God's real and I've got to get serious with God and stop playing around or ignore God, rebel and live a life that I'm going to enjoy and, and uh, do everything that my desires are for this life rather than follow him and serve him. Um, can I just say that serving him has been the, most, the best joy, the greatest joy of my life. I've experienced things I would never have experienced um, myself uh, doing it my way, but God has been so gracious to me, so gracious. Okay, so then we move on uh, to another, another facet here. So that's Bible prophecy, and we could go on and on. Like I say, there's hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of these prophecy, and the margin of deviation is zero, zero. And so, um, but having uh, followed Jesus for a while now, I've been saved for an, a number of years, over 25 years now. In the book of Revelation, it says a funny thing. It says this, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. But it doesn't stop there. And it says, And by the word of their testimony. I'm sure that does mean about their testimony about Jesus Christ. Uh, but also, if you serve the Lord, you will have... God is in us, moving through us, speaking to us by his word. We have experiences with God. And so I'm just going to shortly... Uh, uh, condensed, share a couple of testimonies uh, that I have that challenged me as to, uh, not challenged me, it awakens you to God being absolutely real and tangible in your life. Now, when I go on to this, I just want to uh, reiterate Jeremiah 23, 28 that says, the, uh, the prophet that has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. And then it goes on and confirms, what is the wheat, what is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock? Now, I want to be clear here because there'll be people with all sorts of experiences out there. And there's some demonic and satanic influences. Uh, there's Christians out there that believe they've seen things that I don't believe is scriptural. And so experience is experience, okay? What's going to hold you is the things that have all gone before this with us that have said you. His word is what holds you. Uh, what, I'm about to what I'm about to tell you is like chaff compared to the wheat. The chaff is the stuff that's blown away and burned in the fire. It really doesn't matter. The wheat is what holds you. The word is what holds you. So these are my experiences. I don't want you to draw any doctrine from them. I don't want you to extrapolate anything. God speaks to us through his word. But they are simply where I've seen God in action in my life. And so I can't deny it. My first one was my dad's testimony. At that stage, I was a young, uh, uh, a young Christian, uh, or may or not have been a Christian at that stage. I'm, it was early days. I was still testing out, you know, is this stuff real? What, what's going on here? My dad uh, was on the early fringes. I had a business called Video Magic uh, when videos first came out. Not DVDs, uh, but videos. The old videos. And no one had a video. Uh, they, you, when you went to rent a video, you go to the video store and there's, they started off with very few movies, 20 movies or something. And you'd go in there, you'd have the 20 movie, you know, pick one that you wanted, and you took a machine home with you with the instructions how to connect it to your TV. And so we did that and, he, and, and the business took off. And there was another guy that he was in partnership with and they had a machine that um, did, did your photos in 24 hours. 24 hours! Wow! Okay, so you took your photos. Before that, you used to take all these shots with your camera. Then you'd take, send the film away. In a week's time, you'd get your photos. This one, you used to be able to go. You go in there, you'd give them the film, and you come back the next day, and bang, there were your photos. And you realised you'd left the lens cap on. Uh, that's how it was. You didn't have any. You didn't know whether you were taking rubbish photos. These days, you got the phone, click, 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 or camera, whatever you're doing. And uh, you know exactly because you get to see the LCD screen and off we go, the LED screen. And um, oh, it's sweet as a nut. But in those days, this was revolutionary. And so the business began to take off. It went exponential. He was making thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a day. Uh, so, and in those days, this was back in ooh, 1980s, early 1980s, something on those lines. Uh, and so... Um, it was a lot of money that they were making. And they made the mistake, I guess, of saying, wow, we're going so well here that um, uh, we really need professional help. And so they did. Uh, they went and saw a solicitor to try and get things in shape. At that stage, they were trading as partners. And, they, and he got, got them in shape all right. 
he set up companies and trusts and of course what he did was take all the ownership away from those two partners and um, and actually uh, just took the um, he took all the directorships into his own family and his names and all that sort of stuff and so they effectively robbed them of that. Then he began to run up multiple debts and borrow all sorts of money and uh, in their names that they went guarantor for and um, and the short end of the stick is dad ended up in a position where he, uh, the other guy settled and paid some money. Dad refused to settle and, um, and owed $250,000. Now just to put that into perspective, he ended up buying a house so that he didn't, because he was lo lost everything. Uh, he bought an overpriced house, overpriced house in Mount Morgan for $36,000. So uh, that's what a house in Mount Morgan was worth. The ones in Rocky might have been worth 100000 So with him owing 250000 it's two and a half houses is what he owed. He had no capacity to repay or anything on those sides. He was staring down the barrel at losing everything. He was fighting a solicitor. You know what he did? We, I said to him, Dad, you've got to get professional help. You've got to find a solicitor. He said, no, I'm going to represent myself. God has spoken to me. He said, um, God said this. He said, I'm going to put this trial in the palm of your hand. And at that time, I'm thinking, Dad, you're crazy. You're a lunatic. Um, get some professional help. I was very young, and I just thought, go and see someone who knows what they're doing. And he said, no, God's going to put this trial in the palm of my hand. Well, short end of the stick is they went to court. When they went to court, Dad was sitting on one side by himself. On the other side was um, the man who had ripped him off, and he was sitting there with a couple of Queen's councils and a whole stack of people on the bench and all this sort of stuff next to him. Dad sitting there all alone. First thing that happened in the, in the trial, when the judge sat down, one of the Queen's counsel got up and he said, uh, I'd like to excuse myself without prejudicing my client. I'd like to excuse myself from the case. Um, uh, yep, and so he walked out, and a couple of his lackeys walked out with him. And so, and sure, what ended up happening is uh, they began to find out things that had happened, and eventually, uh, the guy who had robbed them of everything was staring down the barrel of uh, everything. Dad walked in owing two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and walked out owing nada, nothing nothing but the thing that happened in that trial is after they exposed all this they said to dad they said well now that all this has come out as to what's going on he said um the judge said really what what's the, the the trial is now in your hands do you want to prosecute him or do you want to you know this going forward it's in your hands and at that moment dad uh welled up with tears because that was the very word that god had spoken to him at that moment so he went in with his whole future gone and came out owing absolutely nothing God had carried him the whole way I don't care whether you believe it or not I was there I saw it I lived it it didn't happen quickly it, I lived it and I know that it's true and so um, so that that was the first testimony then we've got um, Jazz's mum and uh, she got very, very sick at, at one point and uh, went into hospital and uh, uh, through something that happened with the, they didn't put the drip and all this sort of stuff on, uh, she went into uh, failure on top of her sickness um, and anyway they, they rang us up and um, we'd gone up the week before uh, to see her, take some time off work to go up. Well, then we got a phone call from, the, from one of the relatives saying, listen, uh, you better get up here. The doctor's saying she's not going to make it. Um, and so you've got to get up. So I, I had to say to work, hey, hey, uh, you know, I've got to take some time off with my wife's mother's dying. And so we head up to Mackay and, um, and we arrived up there. And I had been listening to some of Chuck Missler's things, some of that, uh, so Robert Anderson stuff at, at that stage. And God just spoke into my heart no literal voices anything like that he just spoke into my heart and he said she shall live and not die she shall live and not die and we went up there and she was in desperate need like she was gone and the doctor was saying 
she's not going to make it. She had uh, breathing tubes down her throat to, to do a breathing for her. She had dialysis going on. I'm not sure the numbers. My sister was doing some medical stuff at the time, and when I told her the toxic toxicity levels of her blood, uh, it was in the thousands, and it's supposed to be below 200 or something on those lines. Uh, she said, no one makes it from that point of view. That was her words to me at that stage. I, but I said, God has said she shall live and not die. And so, uh, and other, I'm not the only one that was praying. My wife's not the only one that's praying. There were other people praying. It does say nothing about me. Um, but what happened was, so she was in desperate need. And the doctor's saying, look, she's got 24 hours, 48 hours before she passes. And... Um, and I said to the doctor, I remember distinctly standing in intensive care with all the beepers going off and monitors and stuff, and I said, if she, just if, I know it's a big if in your eyes, I said, if, if she was to turn around, what would be the first thing that would have to happen for her road to recovery? And he said to me, well, look, I don't want to raise your hopes because, you know, really it's not going to happen, but... If it was going to happen, what she would need is her kidneys to kick in to try and uh, to get rid of some of this toxic toxicity. Um, so the kidneys would be what would need. So we're with the dialysis and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. In fact, her levels are getting worse. They're not getting better. Uh, I said, yeah, fair enough. Okay. And so I said to Jazz, I said, look, we're just going to pray for that. We're going to pray for that. So we went home. We prayed that night about that. And uh, the next morning we arrived at the hospital and we w went to go in and see her and um, they said, no, 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 you can't come in. And instantly, you know, my heart sank. I thought, wow, has she passed away during the night? Um, and they said, no, 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 there's just been an, a an accident in there and, um, and we sort of got to, um, you know, just got to clean things up before anyone could come in. Well, by the time we got in, we found out what happened. What had happened, you could see it on the floor. For some unknown reason, nobody could explain why, what happened, nobody was there near her or anything. The uh, dialysis tubes had actually sprung out and gone all over the floor. So you had all this red fluid, blood looking stuff all over the floor that had been cleaned up, but you could see the residue of that there. And in the, because of the amount of it and the time it took to, to, um, to clean up, they said, when they finished cleaning up, they looked up and they saw that the levels were no worse. And so they said, well, maybe we'll just leave it out for a little bit and see what happens. And it, they left it out and progressively it got better and better and better. And we just asked the doctor what was the next thing that would need it if she was, to, if she was going to survive, what's going to happen now, what's going to happen now. And we just prayed the next step and the next step. And you know, it was a miracle. She recovered fully. He said she'd be on dialysis for life. He said she'd need this and she'd need that. She might need a walking frame. And today she's got none of that. She recovered in exactly the precise order in which we uh, prayed. He told us she needed that. To, if she's going to go to the next step, we'd pray for that. It just, boom, next day, that was done. Then we go, and it was just miracle after miracle. I don't know if you believe in miracles. I don't care if you believe in miracles. I lived it. My wife lived it. Uh, she's still alive today. Uh, we've been there. So we've saw it and we know the hand of God was in that situation. Uh, so that's that story. Last one I'm going to finish on is um, uh, my little boy Matthew. We've had, we've had four children. One at this time is 21, uh, one 18 and one turning 16 very shortly. And we had a little surprise. We've got a three and a half year old as well called Matthew. Uh, one morning I was, I was laying, I had the alarm clock going on there and I had Vision FM as, as uh, my alarm to go off. And just, you know, just before you awake, you're dreaming or whatever. And uh, I, was, um, I was, it was like, I don't know whether it's heaven or whatever, but it was like Jesus standing next to this other man. And don't ask me what Jesus looked like. I don't know what Jesus looked like. That's the feeling that I got when, when I was there, that this was Jesus, uh, not an angel. I don't know. I didn't see him. I looked at the man, the other guy. Because he's presenting this guy. He said, this is Matthew. He's going to join your family. Okay? And it's a grown man. This is Matthew. He's going to be joining your family. And that was it. And, you know, just as that finished, my alarm went off. And the first thing that came out, there was no lead-in time, and it was 
it was not cut off, it was exact. It came on, the thing came on, it said this. Matthew means gift of God. At that point, I said, wow. I looked over to my wife, who was sleeping next to me, and I said, Dale, are you pregnant? And she said, don't be stupid. We were at the stage, you hear a crying baby in the, in the restaurant. We say, thank God that's not us. Now it is us, chasing the goat round all the, all the females. Looked over, are you pregnant? Of course not. I said, you better go and get some tests. She went and got the tests. We did it a couple of times, of course. She was pregnant. Now today we have little Matthew. You can't tell me, I, I'm inside this head. I know what was, went on. Uh, I don't care whether you believe it or not. I'm just sharing it. And like I say, it's, it's chaff to wheat. Don't read doctrine into it. Don't read anything into it. Base your thing on the word. All I'm saying is they overcome by the blood of the Lamb, but also they walk and they hear and they experience God in their lives, the word of their testimony. And that's where we are. We have experienced that. Nothing on earth could shift that from me. I know I lived it. It happened to me. It happened to me. So we go through these things. You've got why I believe creation, Bible accuracy, you've got history, you've got prophecy, and ultimately, once you believe, you have a testimony. Can I just say this, that if God is real, if God is real, I was where you, I never came from a Christian home. I was totally, uh, no, I wasn't anti-Christian. He was just another, Jesus was just another person amongst every other God on the planet. And if you want to believe in that, that's great. My uncle said to me, he said, if you need Jesus Christ, you need a crutch, that's great for you. I don't need it. But I've come to the conclusion, um, there's a scripture that everyone knows that says, uh, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life. That's a great scripture. But in the same chapter, and I think it goes... Uh, it shouldn't really go before John 3.36 says those, those that obey the Son believe on the Son it says but it means obey the Son have everlasting life but those that don't abide under the wrath of God I want you to think of this that God is so holy that his standard is perfect it says, he that fails at one part of the law fails at the whole part of the law. If you were like me and you said, I don't need Jesus, I'm a good guy, I can, I'll pay for my own sins if I've got to do that at the, at the end. The problem is that the penalty is so huge that you cannot pay. It's like my father walking into that courtroom. He had nothing he was in debt for 37, 36,000 to buy that house in Mount Morgan, and the debt is $250,000. He could not pay. No matter what happened, he was gone. That will be you if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, if you do not submit your life to Jesus Christ. That is you because you don't accept what Jesus has done. See, Jesus, it said, it was in Daniel there, Daniel 9, 27, it says he's, the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. He came so that he could pay the penalty. In that court of law, you're standing there, the judge is about to put the gavel down and sentence you for the debt of $250,000, a million dollars, a billion dollars, a trillion dollars. It doesn't matter, you can't pay. He's about to put the gavel down when suddenly a man comes into the back of the court. And he says, hold it, hold it. Please hold it. He said, I'm going to pay that man's debt. I'm going to pay his debt. And normally the judge would throw this man out of court. But you find out later, this man that's come in is the judge's son. He comes in. These judges are loaded, by the way. I do the tax returns. Loaded. We've got uh, the son comes in. He says, what's the fine? The fine's $250,000. This man's going to pay every penny or, or be in jail the rest of his life. The man says, I'll pay the fine on his behalf. He pays the $250,000 and you get to walk out of that courtroom completely free. A fine that you could never have repaid. That's the gospel. The standard of righteousness is not uh, have you been a good person? The stand all liars will have their all liars will have their uh, place in the lake of fire. My question is: You lied? I know I have. I've lied. I've lied. 
all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. We say, Paul, why aren't you going to hell? If that's the standard, if it's so high, if you can just look at a woman and that be lusting after, that's a, like ca ca committing adultery. Have you lusted? Have I lusted? The answer is yes. We are sinners. We're hopeless. We're slaves to sin. We cannot pay. We cannot pay. We cannot get out of it. We cannot fix ourselves. We must accept the penalty Jesus play, paid. It says without the remission uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Jesus Christ came and shed his blood so that your sins and my sins would be repaid. He becomes the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, the penalty so that we don't have to pay the penalty. He hung on that cross, pierced his hands and his feet, hung on a tree, became cursed. Why? So that you and I could become the righteousness of God of Christ. Even though we're filthy sinners, we accept Jesus Christ. He said, if any man uh, comes to me, I will in no wise cast him out. If you come to him today, you say, Jesus, I know that you're real. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry. I know that I'm living an immoral life. I know I can't fix myself. I cannot pay the debt when I stand. And the day of judgment comes for every man. I cannot pay it. Jesus, will you pay it for me? Come into my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit that I might have the power to live a righteous life. Wash me and cleanse me. You know what he says? He says, though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be made whiter than snow. My prayer for you today, my prayer for you today is that your sins will be made whiter than snow. I don't care what you've done. Say, you say, Paul, you don't know what I've been up to. I've been sleeping around. I've been lying. I've been cheating. Well, God, I don't care if you've murdered somebody. There's no sin. There's no deep, dark. I don't care if you've been a prostitute. I don't care if you've had an abortion. I don't care if you're a homosexual. I don't care if you're an adulterer. There's no sin out there that the blood of Jesus Christ will not cleanse and this burden that you're carrying around of guilt and shame, I can testify it gets washed away. That load of secrets that you're carrying around for the life that you're hiding from others, the face that you put on when others come, that all goes. And you can live clean before the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my prayer for you today, that you'll receive him, that you'll receive him. Once you receive him, tell somebody, Ring up a friend and say, look, I've received Jesus Christ into my life. Tell somebody, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. That's what the Bible says. And then start reading your, get a Bible. If you don't have one, get a Bible. Many houses don't have Bibles these days. Get a Bible, start reading. Don't do what I did. I started reading at the beginning of the book. Genesis, start working through. By the time you get to Leviticus, you wonder what's going on. Don't start there. Start in the book of John. And ask this one question, say, Jesus, who are you? And I tell you, without anyone telling you, you will discover who Jesus Christ is. He will speak to you from the pages of that book. Many skeptics who do not believe in God went out to prove that he did not exist and end up serving him for the rest of their days. My prayer is that you'll be washed clean. And I'm praying for you. If you want to, you can contact me through the website. It would be great to, to touch base with you. Uh, if we can help you in any way, we will. Uh, God bless you as you listen to the voice of Jesus Christ. Amen.